Hello and welcome to video number two in which we're going to have a quick whiz through the adaptations that we see in terrestrial groups to living on land. Um, this really will be a quick whiz because I don't want to, to take too long and speak forever on this front. So um, there are a whole range of different stresses that life on land um, provides to an organism that um, it does not experience if it was living in the ocean. So for organisms to live on land, they need to develop a series of adaptations to overcome these stresses. These adaptations include um, the need to maintain water, something that's called water homeostasis. Um, in, the, uh, in this example of plants, Plants have intake of water and nutrients um, through roots and rooting systems. That's an adaptation to life on land. And they have a vascular system to move nutrients around their bodies. Uh, also in plants, we see um, waxy cuticles as an adaptation. So a waxy cuticle is kind of a layer on the outside of, say, a leaf, such as those shown in the bottom right here. So you can see roots here and a leaf here. Um, and that waxy cuticle that we see on some leaves helps avoid water loss in these groups. In animals like vertebrates, uh, I've got an example of a puffin and a, the interior of a dog here. Um, there are organs such as kidneys circled in purple there to remove waste. Some vertebrates do do this actually very effectively. So birds, my example here, actually excrete solid uric acid. And this is a adaptation towards um, not wanting to lose too much water. If you were, say, a fish, you'd be able to do this in the water. Fish excrete things like urea um, through their gills, whereas vertebrates on land have to work out how to do so whilst minimizing water loss. In arthropods, um, a group we've met several times over the course of these lectures, um, adaptations towards not losing too much water include um, the evolution of spiracles so you can see these on a caterpillar here sometimes called very biblically stigmata these are holes in the um, the the cuticle the exoskeleton to allow uh, air in without um, for respiration but without losing too much water and also different groups have uh, evolved different equivalents of our kidneys so in this example here um these of a, a pupating butterfly these red structures at the back are things called malpighian tubules which are the equivalent of kidneys within the art well within some arthropods mm -hmm. not actually really the equivalent of kidneys but nevertheless they do a, a vaguely similar job there's a whole can of worms i'm not going to get into so another thing you have to consider if you're a land organism is the effects of gravity. In water, uh, buoyancy uh, kind of um, lessens the impact that gravity has on the way that you live your life and the structures that you need. And we see a number of adaptations towards life on land across uh, terrestrial groups. In plants, those come in the form of mechanical support and anchorage from roots helping them to overcome gravity um, and an adaptation that we see in plants in addition to that is the development of hard tissues like wood um, to provide structural support. Arthropods such as this fantastic centipede that you see here um, have their cuticle their exoskeleton that provides support to them. This is something they evolved when they were still living in the ocean so this is actually an exaptation if you remember what that means from a microevolution lecture to life on land, rather than being um, uh, an adaptation that occurred once they got onto land. And in vertebrates, such as this human that's shown on here, uh, these organisms have evolved a skeleton to provide support. It does many other things as well. It's multifunctional, but still uh, one of the, the really useful things it does for us is provide support. We also see changes in locomotion and stance um, in the vast majority of animal groups on land, um, um, I've drawn an example here of the difference between a eurypterid, a, a, a chelicerate that lives in the sea, which walks on its tiptoes essentially, um, compared to a scorpion leg, I think. No, this is an insect leg, my apologies. An insect leg, which has this um, grey shaded uh, turn up at the end here. Um, which is a thing called a plant-grade stance. So this um, reflects a hanging stance that we see in many early vertebrates and in many land-based arthropods. Another problem that you have to deal with if you live on land is UV light. This doesn't really penetrate to any great depth in the ocean, but if you're living on land, you're constantly being bombarded by UV light, which can have problems. Uh, it damages DNA, for example. So land-based organisms have evolved... Um, 
uh, uh, structures uh, and processes to avoid that kind of damage. In the case of arthropods, the cuticle provides that protection. And in the case of vertebrates, the skin provides that protection. And often there are other mechanisms at play that help um, heighten that protection. So for example, in many vertebrates, increases in melanization, uh, pigmentation help fight UV damage. In plants, the protective mechanisms include the deposition of UV absorbing phenolic compounds in the outer epidermal tissue. So in their outer tissues, they have compounds that absorb UV and they also produce antioxidant systems. So there's a, uh, there's a wide variety of different ways of making sure UV light doesn't damage you. Another thing you have to consider if you live on land is how do you reproduce? So obviously all organisms that evolved in the ocean evolved reproductive strategies that work within water. Whereas in um, groups that live on land, water won't always be readily available. We see this in, for example, the evolution of the plants. Um, we see that uh, in liverworts and mosses, um, there are motile sperm that swim in a th thin film of water or splash in water droplets. So water is integral to the process. Um, we see then in the Paleozoic era, um, organisms start to evolve the uh, ability to reproduce by using spores dispersed in the wind. And nowadays we see seed plants which have pollen grains conta that contain male gametes for protection of the sperm. So you can see some examples of seeds and seed pods in the, uh, in the middle image here. Animals in the marine realm can just release eggs and sperm into the sea for external fertilization. That's a viable approach for reproduction if you live in water, but it's not on land because things will, um, your, because your gametes will dry out and often organisms will eat your gametes. And so we've seen in multiple groups, um, such as the harvestmen shown here, different arachnid groups and indeed insects and myriapods, that's millipedes and centipedes, we see a move towards internal fertilization with all of these groups. And we see the same in vertebrates, which often use internal fertilization. And even if not, eggs tend to have a membrane, for example, to gas exchange. So we see many uh, adaptations in reproductive strategies towards life on land. Another thing you have to consider if you live on land is how to get oxygen. So obviously gas exchange is radically different between living in water and living on the land because air is quite different from water. Nothing particularly surprising in that statement, I hope. So in the example of plants, we see numerous specializations towards gaseous exchange. So exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen. Um, those adaptations include stomata as shown on the left-hand side of this image here. These are pores which um, plants can open and close to allow gases to be taken in and released, whilst at the same time reducing water loss. There are also an adaptation towards water homeostasis. Arthropods that live on land have developed a number of different ways to um, breathe uh, air rather than water. These include tracheae, which are shown on the right here. These are little tubes that open to the outside and uh, transport oxygen directly from the outside into for example, muscles where that oxygen is needed. Um, those are found in insects and millipedes and their kin, whereas in um, many arachnids, uh, these organisms use book lungs. These are modified gills, which are, have, have a, a number of different modifications. Feel free to ask about them in the Zoom if you so wish, um, towards uh, breathing air rather than water. And obviously vertebrates such as this fantastic horse from a uh, very old illustration in 1766, in fact, in the middle here, um, vertebrates have a lungs that allow them to breed, breed, that allow them to breathe. Breeding was the last slide. So um, lungs are, are really interesting. They're actually a modified swim bladder. If you uh, are interested in where they've come from, um, this structure is also called a gas bladder, a fish maw or an air bladder, is an internal gas filled organ that contributes to the ability of many bony fish, but not cartilaginous ones, interestingly, to control their buoyancy and thus to stay at their current water depth without having to waste energy. So it's a, it helps them save energy. So all of those are adaptations towards breathing oxygen on land and breathing air. And so that's it for adaptations. In the next um, slide, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the history of life on land. I'll see you there in a second.